Welcome to Humanity at Its Best. Today we have a marvelous idea developed by two guys who said, you know, be scrappy, get it done, and really serve the needs of um, healthcare workers in these really tough times. So welcome to the show. Hey, Carol. Thank you for having us. Uh, so my name is Elliot Charbonneau. I'm uh, from Toronto up here in Canada. Uh, and we launched a service about a month ago called Grocery Hero Canada, uh, or just Grocery Hero, where we connect frontline medical workers with uh, people in their local communities to deliver groceries for them uh, when they get off their shifts. Yeah, and I'm Luca de Vlasis, also from Toronto, Ontario, up here in Canada, and I am one of Elliot's co-founders on Grocery Hero. So Grocery Hero came about uh, about a month ago now. We had one of our friends, uh, and well, now co-founders, uh, Matt, reach out to us. It was one o'clock on a Friday night, so quite late, basically saying he had a, a friend who was a surgeon at one of the hospitals here in, in the GTA reach out and mentioned that he needed help grabbing groceries because he was concerned about heading to the store after shift and uh, running the risk of, of infecting uh, people in the grocery store. So we kind of sat down Saturday morning, had a little brainstorm about how we could help, uh, figure the best solution was to try and pair local frontline medical workers with people in their neighborhoods to grab groceries for them. Um, and then within 24 or 24 hours, uh, Luca, myself and a couple other guys had, had built out a solution and we went live and the rest kind of just took off from there. It came about pretty quick. We kind of stitched everything together without using any code, just uh, readily available uh, applications that exist out there on the internet. And we've been trying to build the plane after we kind of went off the cliff and it's been working out great so far. <laughs> we don't like seeing planes going off of cliffs, but GTA <laughs> is, is that the greater Toronto area? Correct. Yes, that's the greater Toronto area. Great. So what are your backgrounds that you could do this so quickly? Yeah, I'll, I can feel that one. So all of us at some point have been management consultants, uh, and we either still are or were at one time. And so I think the, the skill set uh, that you build doing sort of that job is kind of highly attuned to the solution that we ended up coming out with. So as Elliot mentioned, we use low code to no code tools. Um, but really, you know, really what we were able to do very quickly is determine where there was demand. Uh, and so, you know, we very quickly went from, Hey, you know, medical professionals kind of need groceries to validating that demand through some really quick sort of guerrilla tactics. To then, you know, building out sort of a, a business model, if you want to call it, although we're not a business, but a model proof of concept, and then turning that into reality. And so that sort of that progression from idea to analysis to, you know, quick building using no code tools is something that, you know, each of us in some way uh, had to do on the job. And, and I think it, it helped us uh, get to the right size solution very quickly. And how did you build your database? Yeah, so the original version was uh, just using Google Forms, uh, and then it plugs into Google Sheets. And on the back end, we worked a bit of our magic to just come up with a matching system with a bunch of linked tables. So it's not the, the most technically advanced solution, but to Luca's point, it, it worked and addressed the, the needs of the market that we were trying to uh, help out here. So that was the, the first version of it. Since then, we, we've still kept Google as the, the back end for how we collect and do all the matching, um, but we've migrated to Squarespace form. So it's a little bit more enjoyable or pretty <laughs> to use, at least than the initial version. How'd you get the word out to the medical professionals so that they would say, hey, there's a service here and I could really use it? So I think the one thing that we did quite well is leverage our networks and did that early on. It's sort of like the typical founder story where everybody brings an ingredient and you combine them together and you get the cake baked. And so we each had certain contacts within both the sort of media community within the political community and also within the medical community. And then it was just a case of sort of figuring out, you know, we knew that we needed sort of both sides of the equation. Uh, not only did, did we need demand for medical professionals, which we had validated that at least in some pockets of, of the community existed. So we needed demand from them, but we also needed, of course, a supply of volunteers. And so it was actually sort of a two-pronged outreach strategy. On the one hand, it was working with some of our contacts and, you know, some friends that we had in the, in the medical community to bring the word out to sort of 
gatekeepers of information. And so those are people who write weekly email blasts out to doctors and to nurses and to, to other communities and making sure that we got the word out to them. And that really helped sort of drive sign up amongst medical professionals because, you know, when you have somebody that you trust that says, hey, you know, here's this service, I think you should use it, that lends a lot of credibility to what we do. So that was very important. And on the other hand, we were able to get some really, really, and, you know, we're very gracious to have had some really, really great feedback from some members of local, provincial, and national government who have endorsed what we're doing. So over social media channels. And that, again, was just a, a planned reach out on our part to tap into the networks that we have. And that sort of helped on the volunteer side drive demand because it's, again, you know, sort of, hey, here's this thing, I endorse it, that makes people comfortable with the idea. And then, you know, we also reached out to sort of the media community as well, who, you know, luckily for us, found the idea compelling and were very generous in the way that they were able to spread the word about us. So, you know, if I had to bring it back, it was really about tapping into the few networks that we thought made the most sense that got us the, the highest impact per connection or per minute of effort that we could put in. And, and we optimized for that. And so you've had in, in what, less than a month, you've had over 5,000 signups and over 12,000 volunteers and you're matching these. And is it only the greater Toronto area or are you going beyond Toronto? Oh, so we're, we're across Canada now. We've made matches everywhere from out on the West Coast in Vancouver through to, I think we have a couple over in the Maritimes now. So we've, we've gone out across all the country. Uh, the, the biggest density of, of medical workers and shoppers that we have, though, is, is home here in the GTA. I think that's uh, where we saw the most uptick and to the Chris point where we have most of our networks. So. Uh, we are able to support across Canada and we're continuing to, to grow from coast to coast, which has been great. I think we're up to about 6,000 people who've signed up so far and around 1,500 matches now too. So Fantastic. Yeah, continues to grow. Yeah, I'm sure you've, you've, had, you've heard a story or two that's really surprising or heartwarming. Could you share one or two with us about a match that was made? Uh, happy to. So there's, there's two that jump out at me right away. Um, one was you know, a story that got sent to us sort of unsolicited on, on Twitter. Um, so we had made a match between a medical professional and a volunteer. That volunteer showed up at the medical professional's door. Now, again, we're, we're recommending to all of our members to abide by social distancing guidelines. So the drop-off really looks like I walk up to a medical professional's door, I leave the groceries on the porch or in their lobby or you know, in front of their door and sort of back away so that we're, we're maintaining distance. But what had happened in this particular case is that the medical professional had actually asked their children to draw a thank you notice that was placed on the door. And so this volunteer sent us, uh, uh, you know, blasted it out on Twitter to say, hey, I went to go make this delivery. And there was this really, really nice illustration that obviously a child made, but it was beautiful that said, you know, thank you, gross, thank you to our grocery hero with like a really nice drawing. So that one stuck out to me. And it just showed that just as much as our volunteers are volunteering because they are grateful to the medical community, the medical community is grateful to the volunteers as well. And then on the other side of things, um, we, we heard another story from one of our medical professionals who had gotten a delivery from their volunteer and included in that delivery was a potted plant that was just a thank you gift from the volunteer to the medical professional to say, you know, here are your groceries, you're going to reimburse me for those groceries. But I wanted to give you something else that you could look at and draw strength from and, and remind you that there are people out there that that care for you and for what you're doing. So I think those two stories for me just show that I mean, beyond us as a, as a community being thankful to medical professionals, it's the medical professionals are also just as thankful to the volunteers. And, the, you know, Grocery Hero is really at the core about standing up for each other in, in the midst of a crisis. We always like to ask our guests to say, you know, you did this really quickly. You did your hackathon and you're getting a great response. So what two or three insights do you have for others who want to continue to respond to the COVID pandemic? I think the biggest thing is don't let uh, perfect be the enemy of, of getting something done. Uh, obviously, we built this pretty quickly to something that we thought was an opportunity to help out in our local communities. and. Uh, 
we've been figuring out as we go. So if you have an idea about how you can help out, bounce it off a couple of people and then, and then try to build it. And if it starts gaining traction, you'll find the community will rally around you. You'll get support from people who have the know-how. I mean, we've had some pretty gracious support from Google and MailChimp and some other companies out there that have really leaned in to say, hey, look, we love what you guys are doing. If you need some help scaling this or, or addressing some of the growing pains, we're happy to lean in. Just go for it and try to make it happen. And like I said, the community will rally behind you. And Luca? I think for me, one of the big things is get the word out about what you're doing before you actually finish doing it. And so it speaks a lot to what Elliot said about, you know, be iterative, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And, and it sort of applies to the same about getting the word out. Like what I think one thing that we did quite successfully was when we were doing our initial reach outs to, to individuals who we thought would, would serve as amplifiers of our message. We didn't wait till the thing was launched to let them know about what we were doing. We did that beforehand and said, Hey, we have this thing. We're probably going to go live on Sunday. Is this, is this interesting to you? And what it allowed us to do is build a really critical mass of engagement really quickly. And from that critical mass, it sort of snowballed from there. So yeah, I, I, I think if I had to summarize across what Elliot and I said, it was, it's really like, be, be really scrappy and iterative about it. Don't let perfect be the enemy of done and of, of good enough. Iterate on good enough until it gets better. And make sure that you build that critical mass even before you've you're ready to launch. Because if you wait until everything is perfect to get the word out there, it'll be too late. That's really, really helpful. So thank you so much. Will you continue this for the months to come, do you think? How long will it last? Uh, we are going to keep it running so long as there's a need out there. So unfortunately, I don't think this pandemic is, is wrapping up in the next couple of weeks or so. So as long as we continue to see demand out there in the community, then we're going to continue to help match med workers with people to get groceries for them. So can you give the website so that people, if they want to participate, can find out where it is? Yeah. So that website is getgrocerywhero.com. It's, you know, a really quick sign up. The form takes probably 30 seconds to 45 seconds to fill out. And, you know, we endeavor to match, to get all of our medical professionals matched within, you know, 24 to 48 hours. We have Tom Masterson, CEO and founder of Caregiver Support Technologies. So welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks, Carol, big fan. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So Tom has two stories to tell today. One is of a matching service that he created to help hospital workers uh, during uh, the really strenuous and tough times of COVID-19. And then he's going to talk a little bit about his company and how their core product is also pivoting to helping uh, with caregiving and COVID-19 uh, patients at home. So, Tom, why don't you tell us both stories? Thanks, Carol. And yeah, I'll, I'll give a really quick description of what the company is about and how we uh, positioned it for healthcare workers, uh, because it helps to uh, illustrate what we were trying to do. But the idea behind the company is to take the concept of uh, a village-based community care model, where we used to say it takes a village because you would be able to see your friends in the street and all that kind of thing, and introduce a piece of technology that could actually coordinate a village around a, a family that's struggling with a medical problem, but through digital means, digital roads, digital stores, all those types of things. So this is an intelligent assistant that goes around and regardless of if your friend lives halfway around the world, will find a way for that person to help you as you're dealing with cancer at home or an injury or something like that. So when we were building this, this coordination tool and the pandemic started to hit, we started to see my founder and I, Dylan, we started to see this phenomenon of people propping up all these uh, efforts to organize support in their communities. And we thought, well, we've been building that. That's exactly what we've been working on for the past year. So we thought, who's going to be the best position to accept a coordinated community effort around them? And we thought healthcare workers. That was our initial um, reaction. So we immediately set about making a few changes to the product and putting that out there and getting some great news coverage. The issue being that the infrastructure that we had built was really well suited to a 
singular person whose needs are very clear and rallying around that person in their family unit. So when somebody says, oh, Jill, uh, her son has cancer, it's very easy for everybody in the community to say, ah, okay, well, we all need to help that family. When it's thousands and thousands of healthcare workers that you don't know where they live or exactly what to do, that model that we built doesn't scale quite as well or it doesn't actually fit the requirement quite as well. So it's been kind of an exercise in looking and seeing like how do people support people in their communities. And we think that if there was a broader and more public way for healthcare workers to display their needs, then people in their community would really get around them more easily. But the way that we built the product, it wasn't entirely conducive to that particular situation. So we've kind of just tried not to get too much in the way um, and examine this from afar and just make our difference in the world in other ways. So what are the other ways that you're getting engaged in supporting COVID-19 patients? Yeah, and I think it's an interesting way to describe, kind of think that we all have to consider ourselves COVID-19 patients or at least carriers or anything in that scenario. But um, like a great example of how we work is we've recently started supporting a new community where uh, and they've given me license to talk about their experience. I still try to shield them a little bit in identity wise, but effectively a, a teenager with uh, seven years of dealing with cancer, sort of on their fifth relapse. And all this kid wanted to do when we started helping them out, rallying their community around them was play uh, Nintendo Switch at home. And that was kind of the thing. And so we looked at the world and thought, yeah, we can make that happen in a normal world. But right now, I don't know if you're aware, you can't buy a Nintendo Switch in North America to save your life. It's impossible. This is where the power of this type of approach comes in, is that we just sought out support from everybody in our community. And in under 48 hours, we had a fully funded Nintendo Switch sitting in their living room immediately. So this kid can now play at home, take this thing to the hospital, because that's a cool thing about that product. I don't want to plug Nintendo Switch too much here, but it's like really neat for a patient in that scenario because they can sit with it on the ward as easily as they can sit with it at home. And so it was a really big uplifting moment for us to be able to do that for that family. And then you also talked about just personally experiencing patient care at home right. and that what you're learning from that through your friend's mother yeah. um, that you can apply to anyone out there wanting to hear about how do I take care of a loved one at home who's going through COVID-19? Sure. And I've I've been very privileged in my life. I, I was raised by a doctor and a nurse. I, I came at this idea for a company because I saw my mom who should have had every advantage and capability struggle to take care of my grandfather. And what this experience with COVID has taught me is this is like, I think the single greatest generator of empathy for caregivers we're ever going to see and patients that we're ever going to see because suddenly we all have to behave as though we're immunocompromised and we all have to behave as though our actions could indirectly harm someone that we really care about. And that to me is the biggest piece of this that I draw a lot of hope from is that people are going to look at the world with a little bit more empathy, like Everybody now understands that seniors are really at risk and so are cancer patients and so are people with other types of comorbidities and other complications. And it's been the reality for as long as we've had pediatric cancer that's treatable that those kids can't go to school in a normal way and that you have to de like sanitize everything before it comes in the house. So when we think about how we support these caregivers in our lives, like one is to just understand that they might not ask you for help all the time, but they definitely need it. And for the caregivers, they need to learn the lesson that if they do ask like this family did, people are really willing to pitch in and help out. And it's a it's been a really beautiful thing to watch unfold a couple of times with our company. Just if people are given the opportunity to stay connected to those problems, they're more than willing to pitch in in a way that's really like easy and, and great. It's It's been really cool. So what else have you learned in terms of creating a system to support the individual in the home? The things that are uh, really important there is, I think it's conquering information asymmetry, which is where I believe like a caregiver, the saddest thing I ever hear is they say uh, a phrase like, you find out who your real friends are when somebody in your family gets sick. And meanwhile, the moment that they learned about the illness, they didn't know what to do. And how do they expect their friends to know what to do unless they tell them? And when they sit there just not asking for support, you can hardly blame somebody for 
not knowing exactly how to pitch in. I think that's the biggest piece. The other piece is for us to just all get over the sense of guilt that we face when we when we think about these uh, particular needs that are facing somebody who's fallen on hard times. Like that person shouldn't feel guilty asking for support, yet they do. Their friends and family shouldn't have to feel guilty when they want to say no, yet they do. So it ends up just stifling these conversations. And so the more we can do to take the agency and the emotion out of those conversations. And our solution to that is to pass it through a an emotionless ent- entity that can just walk around digitally and ask people directly without any fear of shame or getting put on, um, on blast in a public Facebook forum for not helping out and not pulling your weight. We think that we can make this really low commitment-free version of allowing people to show their support in a really ongoing way without committing to a regular schedule or requirement for support. So do you have any sort of parting comments for emerging companies in technology that right now are pivoting to uh, respond to the COVID-19 epidemic? I would think really strongly about partnering with somebody who's a lot closer to the problem than you are. I think maybe one of the missteps we could have avoided when we tried to support healthcare workers was that just try, try to go at it without really talking to them first, which was, I think it was it, it was fine. It taught us a lot about the product, but I see a bunch of things happening out in the real world right now where it just seems that the left hand isn't talking to the right in a really, not necessarily harmful way, but in an unproductive way. I, I think one thing I've noticed the last, I haven't gone to a grocery store in a while because I've been self-isolating but uh, pretty aggressively, but the, Thing that I noticed a while ago was I went into a drugstore and the bins were overflowing with hand sanitizer because all these companies have pivoted distilleries and everything to making hand sanitizer and it just seems like there's suddenly too much um, and, and that's a really weird thing because you know we're still short on certain things but I don't know that we need another company pivoting. Like I think all the perfume makers and all the alcohol makers are all making hand sanitizer and it's great but. Ooh, we need to make sure that we're actually addressing problems that are current and upcoming that we can actually maybe start to predict a little bit better if we talk to the right people.